While the musical genre emo originally evolved out of the hardcore punk scene of the mid-80s and expanded into the 90s, most people today remember emo as a bizarre trend in the mid-2000s. If you grew up in this era, you may remember seeing woe is me, long-haired, eyeliner-wearing kids in every high school and mall in America. But let's get a major misconception out of the way. The music they were listening to was actually an emo offshoot called Screamo. These angsty, mostly upper-middle-class suburban youths obsessed with death and self-harm not only created many negative stereotypes about those who didn't care to vibe with the increasingly pop and hip-hop-oriented musical zeitgeist, but Screamo's popularity in the decade also contributed to the subgenre being falsely lumped in with any music with harsh vocals. Whether it be death metal, hard rock, or just about anything with edge, many will ignorantly throw the term Screamo around to describe it. Digressions aside, many people sadly overlook the wave of Midwest emo in the 90s and 2000s. It wasn't nearly as popular, and while it too was lyrically focused on self-denigration and somber themes as its mainstream hot topic counterpart, Midwest emo incorporated math rock and indie rock to its somewhat hardcore punk inspired repertoire. Though some bands opted to veer away from the initial heavier punk sound. One of the most popular and highly praised bands in Midwest emo is American Football. Formed in 1997 in Urbana, Illinois, American Football was originally comprised of Mike Kinsella on guitar and vocals, Steve Lamos on drums and trumpet, and Steve Holmes on guitar and keyboards. The group released but one self-titled EP in 1998 and a self-titled album in 1999 on Polyvinyl Records, then vanished the next year. American Football was an interesting mashup of heartfelt, morose lyrics and complicated, oddly tuned guitar instrumentation that caught the ears of anyone who cared to listen. But their eponymous debut was written and recorded in haste. In fact, it wasn't even supposed to be recorded. See, American Football was formed while its members attended University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and by graduation time, all parties were clearly content with breaking up once the school year was over. It was only through the pleas of Polyvinyl Records founder Matt Lunsford that the band would head into private studios to record their nine tracks of dulcet, jazzy indie rock. The LP would release on September 14, 1999 to very minor success on college radio. They would disband in 2000, seemingly to fade into obscurity. But quietly, the legend of American football's debut album grew larger and larger, becoming the watershed moment of its subgenre, and a gateway into Midwest emo for all who discovered it, from a band that was gone too soon. Kinsella's work did not end with American football. In fact, it didn't even begin with it. Before American Football, Kinsella had worked with his brother Tim in the emo post-hardcore band Cap'n Jazz as the drummer and Joan of Arc as the drummer and occasional guitarist after Cap'n Jazz dissolved. Both bands were highly regarded and noteworthy amongst their fan base, so it was clear Mike had built enough goodwill with Polyvinyl and the audience to back his solo output. Enter Owen. I'm a picture. Now, before we jump in, I do want to note that I will only be discussing Owen's LP releases, as his EPs feel much more like quiet footnotes in between his true progression as an artist. Owen, in many ways, is a spiritual successor to American football. Owen is intimate acoustic guitar-based music, the kind of stuff that can lull you to sleep on a bad day and seriously compel you on a good day. And so, Kinsella returned in September 2001 with Owen's self-titled debut album. Released by Polyvinyl, Mike had worked a deal out with the label to forego studio time and use the advance funds to acquire his own recording equipment. According to Mike, it is his least favorite Owen album, as it was recorded in the effort to train himself in using Pro Tools and he hadn't intended it to be released. He even admitted these songs were so layered and awkwardly structured that he was slightly embarrassed to play them live. 
Despite this, his forlorn whispering and zigzagging arrangement perfectly suits the written material. Lyrically, Owen's debut reads like the confessions of an insecure, shy young man, still dreaming up what-if scenarios of bygone years. I know that sounds a little pejorative, but I can't help but think there's something so real and honest about the lyrics on the album. And while not every track holds up during its 39-minute runtime, I must admit it's among my favorites. If you go, you should know. November 2002 saw the release of No Good For No One Now, which is a respectable follow-up, but I think it fails to bring anything exciting to the table. Kinsella whispers far less, and even expands his vocal repertoire to the occasional outside voice, but the production here is much more on the normal side than before, sadly. Its strongest tracks, Nobody's Nothing and The Ghost of What Should Have Been, are unfortunately hampered by stilted song structures that somehow worked far better on the previous record. It's still a relatively fine release, but feels more like a stepping stone. Dropped on November 9th, 2004, I do perceive is peak Owen in my opinion, though many differ on this. Whereas on the previous two records, there seems to be an imbalance between musical strength versus lyrical strength, I do perceive features songs equally captivating on both fronts. While Mike's vocals are still rather hushed, he sounds much more self-assured in his own skin. Now while there are still songs that feel a bit too long, it feels justified by the inherent value of the writing. Bed Abuse is a tiring seven and a half minutes, but it happens to be one of the strongest tracks in the Owen discography. This was the first instance of collaboration on the main album releases, as the record was actually mixed by Mike's cousin, Nate Kinsella. From start to finish, I Do Perceive is not only a well-written album, it is also an impressively well-formed mix of the best of No Good For No One Now and his self-titled debut. I spend entire days in this bed too small for two. At Home With Owen hit the shelves on November 7th, 2006, and is arguably the most acclaimed record in his discography. Though its greatest weakness is that it's front-loaded with its best material, leaving the album to sag a bit on its final three tracks. At Home with Owen also marks the first time that the solo project was tracked in a real recording studio. The LP was recorded and mixed at Semaphore Recording in Chicago, and the production is more crisp, but also a little more conventional than previous releases. The album features the sad waltzes of Pietro Crespi, which is definitely the most popular track in the Owen library, and for good reason. With a folksy yet complex main acoustic guitar riff, the song twangs away warmly, and while it is structured conventionally, it's written masterfully. You can tell that Mike has begun to hit his stride. The sad waltzes of Pietro Crespi. New Leaves released on September 22, 2009, and seems like an intentional exercise in distillation. Kinsella's efforts are noticeably streamlined, with more focus on songwriting digestibility. The longest cut on New Leaves, Never Been Born, is a tastefully restrained 4 minutes and 43 seconds. In addition, the title track and Good Friends Bad Habits are as syrupy sweet as they are meaningful and contemplative. A trenchant critique is an odd one here, not that it feels out of place or is bad or anything. It's actually one of my favorites, but musically it feels like a direct continuation of the previous album's Sad Waltzes of Pietro Crespi, again led by a jangly and strikingly memorable guitar riff. I would mark New Leaves as the start of the modern era of Owen. Songs are less in the youthful here and now, 
less concerned with interpersonal dramas, but more centered around Kinsella's growth from young adulthood to middle age, his marriage and eventual fatherhood, and his occasional reluctance to accept it. Well, what's a boy without a voice to do? Literary romances. So if New Leaves sparked a more matured perspective for Kinsella, the November 8th, 2011 release, Ghost Town, goes full bore. Worn out and feeling his age in droves, he sullenly faces the past and gazes with hope into the future. On No Language, Kinsella's confessional lyrics reveal his unresolved anger with his late father. With lyrics like, Unless you can rise from the dead, I'll die like this, it's clear that closure and resolution seem impossible given the circumstances. The final track, Everyone's Asleep in the House But Me, sounds akin to a mashup of the songwriting styles featured on I Do Perceive and New Leaves. By far the best song on the record, Mike details his desire to relive the excitement of his youth and his frustrations with domesticated life. Produced by Brian Deck and Neil Strauch, Ghost Town is sonically much more restrained than the last release, with layers of texture mostly limited to cellos and violins. Try to walk a straight line But it's so hard with these cross ties. For pronunciation's sake, I'll give you the English translation of this next album title. The Friend of the People was released July 2nd, 2013. This album is much more layered than Ghost Town, with accompaniment by pianos, backing vocals, lots of reverby guitars, and more. I think by this point in his career, Kinsella's minimalist approach on most of his albums had begun to wear a bit thin, and the wider, more involved production on this record breathes life into songs that otherwise might feel a bit empty at times. Blues to Black, Bad Blood, and A Fever are bold enough to be rock songs, in stark contrast to a majority of the rest of the Owen catalog. Breaking from his typical cycle of songwriting proves to be the smartest thing he's done up to this point. A Fever is actually a re-recording of an older song by the same name, originally featured on 2009's Seaside EP, however this version foregoes the Spartan adherence to few musical colors. It's an expertly crafted alternative indie rock track describing Kinsella's first sexual experience with his then wife. Where Do I Begin weaves seamlessly into Vivid Dreams, a nice subtle callback to the way most days transitions into most nights on Owen's debut album. Out of all of the Marriage Era albums, I recommend this one the most. It's varied, fun, and, as always, somber. The King of Wise, released on July 29th, 2016, is a definite treat for those who prefer Owen to stick to mellow acoustic tunes. The sound is stripped back, but not to any detriment, and one should look no further than the opening track, Empty Bottle, for proof. This song is softly heavy, with pounding drums driving the verse rhythm, proving that Owen's songs don't need to feel like straightforward rock to get your head nodding. A Burning Soul is a warmly presented revisiting of a previously explored theme. In the song, Kinsella now looks back on his father's alcoholism, now feeling sympathy in his older age and similar circumstances. Ultimately, Kinsella seems resolved with his father, but also quite aware that he too bears the cross of a dependency on alcohol, likely a result of his upbringing. I'll let you decide. In between pursuing Owen and several other projects, American Football had been revived in 2014, proving unquestionably the longevity and resonance of Kinsella's work with an audience that grows increasingly diverse. American Football's anthem of youthful regret, Never Meant, even became a meme of sorts. Together, the band released a self-titled album in 2016 and another in 2019. Smack dab in the most turbulent global emergency in recent memory, The Avalanche hit on June 19th, 2020. These songs drip with hopelessness, 
angst and shame in such a way that I'd argue are more miserable and woeful than ever before. Mike candidly tackles his marital infidelity, his recent divorce, and how he fits into the world as a performer and artist. I'd rather not get tangled into the minutia of the lyrical content of this record, as I believe this album is a psychological and emotional tour de force that needs to be experienced. Currently, Kinsella still lives a humble life in Chicago, sporadically touring solo and with American football, and will release his 10th full-length Owen album of original tracks, titled The Falls of Sue, on April 26, 2024. I can't say for certain, but this may be the start of yet another era of bereaved intrigue in the Owen discography. All in all, Mike Kinsella is one of the most upfront lyricists of our time, even through his transition from a single 20-something-year-old to a divorcee with children in his late 40s. So few musicians can write a song so hyper-specific to their own situation and express it in a way that can be understood and related to by virtually anyone, and yet he's been able to convincingly craft remarkably sincere poetry set to unadulterated and complicated musical brilliance on a regular basis for the better part of the last two decades. So I'll tip my hat and raise a glass in the hope for many more years of intimate songwriting from Mike Kinsella and his band, Owen. <laughs> 